The Verdict, a sidebar production, hosted by Kent Myers and Mick Cornett. As a part of its traditional and continuing commitment to public and community service, Crow and Dunleavy sponsors The Verdict. Also sponsored by Delta Dental, Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, and C.H. Guernsey and Company. Each week on The Verdict, we present an objective discussion of contemporary and legal issues, topical issues that will affect Oklahomans in their daily lives. The Verdict, a sidebar production. And welcome to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett, and I am joined, as always, by one of Oklahoma's top legal experts, Kent Myers. Kent, good to see you again. It's nice to see you. Uh, we're glad to be here today on this Sunday, and we want our viewers to uh, uh, listen carefully to what we're going to talk about today, because it's something that I hope they've never experienced, but many, many families in Oklahoma do experience it. It is the plight of the abused and deprived child in Oklahoma. Oklahoma has literally thousands of children in uh, DHS, uh, Department of Human Services, custody or control because they have either been abused or deprived in their homes. Now, I want to distinguish that from the delinquent child. The delinquent child is in the system, in the juvenile justice system, because it led, allegedly something uh, the child has done. In this other type of case, the abused and deprived case, the child is in the system not because the child has done anything wrong, allegedly, but because the people who are in custody and control of that child have abused it, has de have uh, deprived it, but in any event, the child is subject to the control of the state of Oklahoma and the juvenile justice system, and uh, through no fault of their own. They can be an age anywhere from a week old to 17 and a half or 18 years of age. Uh, it runs the whole gamut. It is a, a, an enormous problem in Oklahoma being administered uh, by many competent, uh, dedicated people, but nevertheless a problem, and that's what we're going to address today. It's a concern that affects all of us, and we'll get to it when we return on The Verdict. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. The Verdict is pleased to have as a sponsor C.H. Guernsey and Company, providing architectural and engineering services to clients throughout the U.S. and around the world. American Express Tax and Business Services. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma, working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. American Express Tax and Business Services. In Oklahoma City, the phone number is 405-843-5311. children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all of the quality assistance and representation that can be offered in our legal system. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children has over 350 of the best attorneys and volunteers in Oklahoma County who donate their time and services to represent children. For more information, call 405-23-CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers is going to introduce our guests. Today we're very pleased to have two people that know more about the plight of abused and deprived children in Oklahoma than anybody else. There are two guests we've been wanting to have on for a long time, and let me start out by introducing the guest across the table from me, a good friend, Howard Hendrick, Director, Department of Human Services. 
Governor Keating's cabinet secretary for health and human services. Uh, Howard was 12 years an Oklahoma State Senator, is a Southern Nazarene University uh, graduate as well as OU Law, and uh, Howard also has his master's in business administration, is a certified public accountant, but probably most important is married and has four children. Howard, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. Right next to me on my right is the Honorable Roger Stewart, Special Judge of Oklahoma County Juvenile Division in Oklahoma City uh, since 1995. Judge Stewart obtained his uh, law degree and his undergraduate degree from the University of Oklahoma and has served as an Assistant District Attorney, an Assistant United States Attorney, and an Attorney for Department of Human Services before becoming a judge. Once again, most importantly, uh, Judge Stewart is married and has three children. Uh, Judge Stewart, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. We're glad to have you. Let me uh, start out, uh, Howard, and ask you to distinguish for our guests, if you will, between the abused, deprived child on the one side and the delinquent child on the other mm -hmm. side of the ledger. A delinquent child is a child who commits an act that if uh, they were an adult could be proven to be a crime. And so they're they go through the judicial process and they're ultimately put into the custody of the Office of Juvenile Affairs, which is a separate state agency from the Oklahoma Department of Human Services. Uh, in the case of de uh, deprived or uh, abused and neglected children, they did nothing wrong, but either they were the victim of a crime or maybe not necessarily, they may not have risen to the, the level of a crime, but some situation exists that needs to be corrected for the child to have a safe uh, experience as a child and so they are placed into the custody of the Department of Human Services as they go through the judicial process. Well, let's say a report is made to the appropriate authorities mm -hmm. and I suppose there's several different mm -hmm. uh, numbers that one could call mm -hmm. to do that and the police are notified the judge that a child or children are in an abusive or a dangerous situation and they go out and pick up the child or children to protect them. What happens in Oklahoma County, as an example, after that pickup occurs? All right. Well, after the pickup, um, children are taken to the uh, children sh the shelter that's located over by the juvenile court um, house and 59th and Classen, basically, and Classen Court, right? Yeah. And they're placed there temporarily um, until uh, foster appropriate foster care home. Uh, emergency foster care or temporary foster care home can be um, located or until uh, maybe an appropriate relative, grandparent, uh, relative, uh, actually the statutes say kinship, which could be someone who's not a relative but um, has a significant relationship with the child, can be located and the child then placed with them. Judge, who's going to determine what's the best place for the child at that point? Well, at that point, the Department of Human Services is uh, making those kinds of determination. Now, after a child is removed from a home, within, 20, within uh, 48 hours, uh, there is a hearing called a show cause or emergency custody hearing in which a referee, uh, a designee of the court, makes a determination as to whether or not there is uh, likelihood of abuse or neglect in the home and to determine whether or not the child should remain in DHS custody, temporary custody, or whether or not the child should be returned home at that time. Let me uh, focus, uh, Howard, just a minute on the shelter. Uh, that's not a lockup. That's not a jail. No. Uh, there's no, no lockup facility there at the juvenile shelter. Uh, there have been reports from time to time that you experience overcrowding <coughs> at the shelter. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that a frequent uh, occurrence? And if so, what do you do about it? It varies from time to time. Uh, uh, it, it's a function, really, of a, comp a number of things. It's a function of whether or not the police are really involved, for example, in doing a lot of uh, meth lab hits and things like that. These kinds of things really result in a lot of kids coming in at uh, very quick rates. Uh, it also is a function of how many foster homes we have available. Uh, we have we subcontract out some of the services, for example, for a while we had a an agreement with the Lutheran Social Services to take on particularly the infants. Uh, Lutheran Social Services has recently gone on to some financial challenges and so we've moved that contract to Sunbeam Family Services which has a very rich good tradition in our community of delivering social services. Many of the foster homes that they were uh, uh, facilitating agreed to, that Lutheran was facilitating went with Sunbeam so we moved those children very much into that direction. 
We've done a number of things to try to minimize the risk to kids of having overcrowding. One is to we've staffed in excess of really our licensed capacity so that when those events do occur, we have adequate people there to take care of it. Uh, but even that from time to time is inadequate. And so even recently, although we haven't fully deployed this at this time, we're, we're in the process. We have already reached oral agreements with a number of contiguous counties. So uh, where those counties may have youth and family services situations and uh, law enforcement may bring someone to the shelter, we may have to go on divert as an emergency room would have to go on divert and say, look, we just really can't take, we're beyond what we think is realistically uh, feasible and if they can't find a family uh, person or they, they haven't been able to determine that then we'll divert them to maybe El Reno or to uh, Shawnee or maybe to Family Junction in the eastern part of the county trying to find a place so we don't get into the situation where kids are uh, put a, a reasonable number of kids are put into that shelter. Let's carry the process Judge on uh, to the next step really to the concluding steps. All right. What happens to the child once that they've been put in the shelter, been put in a foster home, we'll say, and then your court system is starting to deal with what ought to happen to that child? All right. uh, the vast majority of uh, cases that are filed in Oklahoma County and elsewhere across the nation are what we call reunification cases. And reunification. Uh, reunification. And that is that we try through services and um, uh, treatment to return a child to their home. Now there is a group of cases that are called heinous and shocking cases where the abuse and neglect is so severe that we do not try to make reunification efforts. But by and large, we try to reunify children in the home. This uh, nation has traditionally had a strong uh, policy of uh, preserving homes and that's in accordance with that. So we have, we set the case for an adjudicatory hearing or which is nothing more than uh, a determination as to whether or not the child is in fact deprived or not deprived. If the child is determined not deprived, then uh, the case is dismissed. If the child is determined to be deprived, then our next step is to set the case for a disposition. DHS workers go in, they do an analysis of what are the conditions that led to the deprived adjudication, and prepare a treatment plan that, um, with a view towards correcting those conditions so that we can uh, return the child to the home uh, for example, if a parent was suffering from a drug and alcohol problem and that was the, one of the basis for the child being removed from their home, then the treatment plan would require them to um, access inpatient or outpatient drug and alcohol uh, treatment. At that point, we enter an order and adopt that treatment plan as an order of the court, order them to do it. Um, we periodically review the case. If the parent corrects the conditions, the child's returned to the home, the case is ultimately dismissed. If the parent fails to correct the conditions, then we seek to terminate, the DA seeks to terminate the, the parental rights to free them up for adoption. Let me jump in and get us to a first break. We'll be right back. We're discussing DHS and the plight of our underprivileged children. We'll be right back. I'd like to offer my most sincere congratulations to the firm of Crow and Dunleavy, the employees and attorneys, uh, profound contributions to the state of Oklahoma for this past century, and I wish you well for this coming century. Thank you. Happy anniversary, Crow Dunleavy, and thank you for 100 years of providing quality legal service to the state of Oklahoma. We wish you much continued success and growth. St. Gregory's University has been changing the lives of people like me for 125 years. Affordable, private Catholic education, balanced with dedication to community and service, makes St. Gregory special. We're extremely proud of our students' outstanding academic achievements and our nationally ranked athletic teams. It's when you help a student build a future of balance, integrity, and service that you change a life forever. St. Gregory's, a community for life. We are C.H. Guernsey & Company. We provide engineering, architecture, and consulting services to clients across the nation and around the world. Our corporate headquarters are located in Oklahoma City, and we have branch offices across the country, including Tulsa. We have provided quality service to clients for nearly 75 years. At Guernsey, we believe in quality work, 
and unconditional client satisfaction. To learn more about C.H. Guernsey and Company, log on to our website at chguernsey.com. Bringing out the best in each student. That is the simple goal and tradition of Heritage Hall. The focus on the individual shapes the educational experience at Heritage Hall. Each student benefits from small classes, able, dedicated teachers, a solid academic curriculum, and exceptional co-curricular programs of athletics, arts, community service, and other activities, parental involvement, personalized counseling, and the development of responsibility, integrity, and love of learning. If you want education taught with pride, then you want Heritage Hall. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers back on The Verdict. We're talking to Judge Roger Stewart and also to the Director of the Department of Human Services, Howard Hendry. Kent, where are we here? We were talking about the child in the juvenile justice system, and we have gotten to the point where let's just assume that the uh, parental rights to that child have been terminated because of the conduct, the misconduct of the parents or neglect of the parents. Then we have a young child that that no longer has, legally, has parents. Uh, I guess, uh, Howard, that brings up the subject of adoption. What does your agency do about that? We really have had tremendous success the last three or four years in adoption. Uh, we, we reorganized. When I went to the department in 1998, we were growing the number of kids in foster care by about 20% per year, compound growth rate. In other words, we had about 20% more kids in foster care than we had at the beginning of the year for each of the previous two or three years. And we had to really change that because it's just, kids were getting stuck and what we did was we pulled out the adoption process organizationally into an entirely different unit it doesn't report to the same operations although we kept the treatment activities with the worker who had the treatment workers a case and then those those two people together pushed these children through adoption at tremendously faster rates over the last four years we've placed almost 4,500 children for adoption that's more children than we placed for adoption the previous 14 years combined uh, is that statewide that's statewide so uh, in terms of getting kids uh, through the system, we're doing a much better job. How do you do it? Well, How do you find an adoptive parent? We, have, we do a lot of different ways. There's a lot of sources. Some may be the foster parents in some cases. They're the best placement that fits. Some cases we uh, have matching parties where uh, people who are interested in adopting, they show up at a party and we'll bring children to the party. And it's not uh, offensive in terms of any way. They just go out there and play and they can learn about each other. Some may th learn about their background. Lots of different ways uh, people just make an application to the department. So it's a fairly uh, vigorous activity on the part of our adopt SWIFT adoption team statewide. Good. I, did you have something to say about that? Um, I'm finding that um, there, at one point foster care was viewed as a temporary placement for children until uh, reunification could occur or until termination and adoption. More and more, however, uh, foster care parents are in fact becoming adoptive parents. Uh, children have been with them for two or three years sometimes and uh, uh, have strong bonds of affection with them. And uh, foster parents, I had a case last Friday where a foster parent, first, first child they took from foster care, they got the child when he was two months old and uh, last Friday uh, we uh, uh, signed the paperwork for an adoption. And uh, that's a happy ending. It's a happy ending, and there's many, many happy endings in our system. Well, let's talk about a, a, a daily Oklahoma headline of two or three weeks ago uh, that <clears throat> wasn't quite so happy sounding, at least, mm -hmm. and that is missing children in Oklahoma has mm -hmm. DHS lost mm -hmm. 900 children or whatever mm -hmm. the number mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of a missing children problem in Oklahoma do we have, mm -hmm. if any? Mm -hmm. Howard? Well, Missing children can be defined a lot of different ways. In that particular case, there was missing data, not missing children, which was the subject of that story. Uh, but in fairness to the reporter, they had checked out some sources and they really believed that to be correct. So I'm not being critical of that at all. Okay. We do have children that do go AWOL. That is to be distinguished from kids that we just don't know where they are. Those are just runaways. Right, they're runaways children. Right. So if you look at our system, how good is our system in terms overall? And what are we doing uh, with, with kids? Generally, we believe we do a very good job of preventing AWOL situations. But what I think we've learned from this story, which we've done a lot of internal analysis, as you might imagine, when you get that kind of experience, <laughs> what we've learned is we could do a better job, actually, of trying to find children once they do run. We do think we have a better, very good system of preventing runaways. There's three primary reasons why that's true. 
Number one, we were the first state in the nation to have a federally approved statewide child welfare information system. And we're still one of only four states that has a federally approved statewide child welfare information system. We think that information is very accurate for a second reason, and that is that that data in that system is not just data we just stick in there. We actually pay foster parents' claims off of that data so that we know that there's some internal integrity in the system that we're using to keep track of that data. And finally, we have a very high visitation rate and rec uh, expectation. I remember talking to the child welfare director in New York City and said, how often do your uh, workers go out and visit their foster kids? Well, they'll be doing well if they get a visit once a year. Well, our, we expect each of our children in foster care to be visited monthly. And uh, I can't say this was true when I first came to the department. We actually had kind of an expose from the Tulsa world about the fact we were visiting per, uh, kids only 30 to 40 percent. But uh, over the last three years, we've visited children about 90 percent of the time since they've been in foster care. And over the last nine months, 95 percent of the kids in foster care get a monthly visit from their workers. Let me break in just one one. Quick question, how many kids are in foster care in Oklahoma, just approximately? Approximately on any given day is about 7,000. Over the course of the year, we'll have 14,000 different children in care. Okay. Let me jump in here. I want to give each of you a chance to kind of sum up your views on all this. Judge Stewart, why don't you go first, a minute, minute and a half on, on this topic. Right. Well, um, what I'd like to see in Oklahoma County with respect to, and across the state with respect to children who um, are abused and neglected by their parents is participation in the community. I believe that government's just about doing all that it's going to be able to do. I mean, there's always room for improvement, but until people in the community step forward to uh, participate as foster parents, to participate as court-appointed special advocates, volunteers in the system, um, we really are not going to make the kind of progress that we need to make. Uh, Mother Teresa said that prayer leads to knowledge, and knowledge leads to love, and love leads to service, and I think that uh, first of all, I would like for Oklahoma County and the folks across the state to pray for our courts and pray for our system, social workers, attorneys, judges in the system. We have a really hard job. We have really high burnout uh, and turnover rates because it's a hard job involving difficult decisions uh, uh, for any humans to make. But second of all, I'd like to see the system open itself up um, and create forums so that folks within the community can come in and get to know, develop the knowledge uh, of the children and the needs that are in our system. Because I believe if they do, I believe that in what Mother Teresa's prescription that it will in fact lead to love. And I also believe that it will lead to service. And that's again what I think is the primary need of our system. Judge Stewart, thank you. Mr. Hendrick? Two points. First of all, one of the reasons why I think the pressure is so great, as Judge Stewart right, rightly pointed out, is family decay. The decay is so prevalent. At a, we're, we now have, according to the National Kids Count, 34.2 percent of all households in America with kids are headed by a single adult. That's an all-time American high. And not to say that many of those people aren't doing a great job and they're heroes, actually. Many of those single parents are doing a fabulous job. But it's just very difficult to get the kind of outcomes in the, those situations that we want to have for kids. It's just hard. The second thing is uh, the need for foster parents. I just want to highlight that. I think uh, we're always needing to have uh, more supports. There's two kinds of ways to look at this. One is to look at the natural supports of families which are deteriorating. The second is to look at artificial supports, which is the system that we're all involved with. Establishing relationships, as Judge Stewart rightfully pointed out, is really the best way to grow some, some artificial supports. Certainly uh, Lawyers for Children and a lot of other volunteer groups have been wonderful. We could never have done what we've been able to do without that. But we have to grow both sets of, of supports. We need to improve our natural supports in the families themselves. And then we have to have the community step up and help us with uh, stronger artificial supports for families. Mr. Hendrick, thank you for coming thank on. You. Judge Stewart, appreciate you being here. Thank Kent and I will be back with a final word after this. All children deserve a life of hope and love but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all of the quality assistance and representation that can be offered in our legal system. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children has over 350 of the best attorneys and volunteers in Oklahoma County who donate their time and services to represent children. For more information, call 405 
2-3 child. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. We are so pleased to congratulate Crow and Dunleavy for their support of the arts and culture in our community and the whole state of Oklahoma. Particularly, we are pleased that they have given us the opportunity to promote the Arts Power campaign on the television show so that we may bring art and music teachers back to our elementary schools all over the state of Oklahoma. Happy anniversary, Crow Dunleavy. We are proud of you. At this at-risk elementary, teachers couldn't reach many students until they began to teach with the arts and the whole school blossomed. Yet there are many stories where bringing the arts back to school produced dramatic turnarounds. Call now. Help give more Oklahoma kids the arts power they deserve and be a part of something big, Oklahoma's future. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers back to wrap up another edition of The Verdict. And Kent, I learned a lot today. I did too, and uh, I want this last minute or so that we're with our viewers to be a solicitation, not for money, but for assistance. Uh, we heard both our guests uh, talk about the need for community support, community involvement, and there's a place for anybody that wants to get in and volunteer to help the youngest, uh, most vulnerable Oklahomans we have are young children who have done nothing wrong but are being abused and deprived. Uh, if you want to uh, assist Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, their website is www.oklahomalawyersforchildren.com. I think you've got the DHS website. I do. OKDHS.org. That's OKDHS.org. And of course, one website people need to keep in mind is The Verdict's uh, website. If you have an idea for a television show, a topic that you'd like to see us discuss, just uh, log on and uh, send us an email, theverdict.tv. And if they want to volunteer uh, to do anything in regard to abused and deprived children in Oklahoma, they can let us know and we'll let the appropriate uh, agencies know. Certainly the need is there. Yeah, the need is there. Can't another good show. Thanks again to our guest, Judge Roger Stewart and Howard Hendricks. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next time on The Verdict.